here this uh, Holy Thursday here in St. Mary's. In the Epistle of <coughs> Mass of Holy Thursday evening. He's taken from St. James chapter 5. Taken with St. Paul, letter to the Corinthians, to the Corinthians, chapter 11. Brethren, when you come therefore together unto one place, it is not now to eat the Lord's Supper. For everyone taketh before his own supper to eat. And one indeed is hungry, and another is drunk. And what have you, not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God, and put them to shame that have not? What shall I say to you? Do I praise you? In this I praise you not. For I have received of the Lord that which I also have delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and giving thanks, broke and said, Take ye and eat, this is my body, which shall be delivered up for you. This do for commemoration of me. Like manner also the chalice after he had supped, saying, This chalice is the new testament of my blood. This do ye, as often as you shall drink, for the commemoration of me. For as often as you shall eat this bread and drink this chalice, you shall show the death of the Lord until he come. Therefore, where whosoever shall eat this bread, or drink the chalice of the blood, Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a man prove himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of the chalice, for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh judgment unto himself, not to serve the body of the Lord. Therefore there are many infirm and weak among you, and many sleep. But if you would judge our, but if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But whilst we are judged, we are chastised by the Lord, that we do not be, be not condemned with this world. In the gospel, in that according to Saint John. Chapter 13. Before the festival day of the past, Jesus knowing that his hour was come, that he should pass out of this world to the Father. Having loved, loved his own who were in this world, he loved them unto the end. And when the supper was done, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas, the son of Simon the Iscariot, to betray him, knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hands, and that he came from God, and goeth to God. He riseth from the supper, and layeth aside his garments, and having taken a towel, girded himself. After that he putteth water into a basin, and began to wash the feet of the disciples, and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. He cometh therefore to Simon Peter. And Peter saith to him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, what I do, thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter said to him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, I war if, if I wash thee not, thou shalt not, thou shalt have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He that is washed not needeth not to, but to wash his feet but is clean, moldy, and you are clean, but not all. For he knew who he was that would betray him. Therefore he said, You are not all clean. Then after he had washed their feet and taken his garments, being set down again, he said to them, Know you what I have done to you. You call me Master and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If then I, being your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that as I have done to you, so you do also. That's what the words of today's.
in which the priesthood shows itself. Our Lord Jesus Christ has prophesied in the Old Testament about this priesthood. And Abraham, by the miraculous power of God, won a great battle. And he conquered the five kings in order to save the four kings. And two of those kings, the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah. And he saved Sodom and he saved Gomorrah. And amongst these that were inside of Sodom and Gomorrah was his nephew Lot and his family. It was a miraculous victory that Abraham won with just a few soldiers. They were not soldiers, they were shepherds. They were not soldiers, they were shepherds that pulled the sword that night. And shepherds went into battle against five armies. And shepherds, without any knowledge of the war of this world, went into battle and defeated the five armies. And this is very important because even in physical battles, because there have been physical battles and there will be physical battles again, God gives the victory and not man. And God gives the victory through his own divine omnipotent power and not through our skill with the sword. And Abraham realized that he had just defeated five kings in a great battle. They had defeated the shepherds. They knew how to take care of sheep. They didn't know how to fight. But when they heard that Lot was captured, and when they heard that Abraham's nephew was captured, and that his nephew had to be saved, they went into battle against five armies. And they were fearless in their first battle, and they defeated the enemies of God to save Sodom and Gomorrah. And then Melchizedek came. Melchizedek who would be the sign of the new priesthood, and he was the king of peace, and the king of the city of peace, for he was the king of Salem, the city of peace. And Melchizedek had not the end of days or end of life, and he offered a sacrifice of bread and wine. And one day the sacrifice would be offered again, also by a shepherd, and by the king of peace. And they'll have no beginning of days, no end of life, and the enemies of God will be defeated. What is it that wins our battles? How are we going to win the battle against the deep state and the coronavirus? How are we going to win the battle against the one world government that has decided to make Jesus Christ illegal because he's not safe? Two nights ago I had my first case, of which there shall probably be many others. Travel with the body and blood and soul divinity of Jesus Christ to bring Holy Communion to a man. You want to confess in Holy Communion? When I arrived, he said, Father, you have to keep a safe distance. The rule is six feet. So I was allowed the privilege to hear his confession in the street from a distance of six feet. But it was not safe to receive Jesus Christ. He came with a host, but there were no takers. There were no receivers. Many times, the King of Peace has come and what did the King of Peace say on Palm Sunday morning? When he came down that mountain of Olivet and looked over the mountain to the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if only thou hadst known the things that were for thy peace. Where does peace come from? <laughs> comes from the priesthood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was established this night. And things are not much different at each stage of the age of peace, because when the King of Peace comes, one of the 
great prophets of the King of Peace in 1914 was the Holy Father, Giuseppe Sartre, St. Pius X. And he saw the whole world being torn apart by a world war that was about to come. And he saw the millions of lives that would die before they died. And he saw all the sorrow that would come. And he said, I have the answer to the sorrow of this world war. That you will call the war to end all wars. And it is the king of peace. You don't have to have a world war in order to prepare for the new world order that will be the order of his antichrist. And he tried to barter peace in the name of Jesus Christ. And they would not. And it was the cause of the death of St. Pius X. He wept as Christ wept on Palm Sunday Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if only thou hadst known the time of thy visitation. How many times have I visited you? But thou didst not know the things that were for thy peace. Now surely he will give up on Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a lost case. Does Christ give up on Jerusalem? He does not. So what happens? We arrive on this Holy Thursday night, a few days later. And our Lord Jesus Christ is going to establish his holy priesthood of the New Testament in his twelve apostles. All twelve of them. And he will say to the twelve of them, You are clean. You are clean. But not all. For there is one of you that is a devil. And that one shall betray me this very night. And that's what he said. He made him a priest. His priesthood is most mysterious. It is most wonderful. It is beyond our comprehension. And so the twelve men could not comprehend it. Certainly the one that betrayed him had no comprehension, though he was made a priest. And after he was made a priest, what does St. John say? He was newly ordained as Judas Iscariot was. And what happened? The devil entered him. And we have the reading of the epistle today. On this Holy Thursday, where St. Paul gives a warning. Do not eat the body and blood of Jesus Christ in the state of mortal sin, but let a man prove himself. And let him know that if he does eat in the state of sin, he eats and drinks unto his own destruction. And we know one man that did. And he received the first Holy Communion on this night. Judas Iscariot, within 12 hours, you be dead. Within 12 hours of his first Holy Communion, of his being ordained priest and consecrated bishop, of his being called friend by God himself, he will die hanging himself by a tree, by the halter of a donkey, in despair. That's what's going to happen to that priest. He surely didn't understand. What about the other 11 priests? What about them? The chief of them is called Simon Peter. Now, Lord Jesus Christ ate the first supper according to the Jewish ritual. St. Jerome tells us he did this to show that he was fulfilling the old law, not destroying it. But then he came in for a second meal. And the second meal was not according to the Jewish ritual. In the second meal, he instituted the holy sacrifice of the Mass. He consecrated those twelve men bishops. He gave them the first, first holy communion. In order to show that something different was happening, 
He went out from the first meal. He girded himself with an apron. And he came back in. And he went straight to St. Peter. And he said, I am going to wash your feet. But before he said it, what did he say? Simon, and not only you, Simon Peter, but all 11 of you, including the 12th one, Judas, who is not clean, but especially you 11, you do not understand what I am doing. You don't understand what I'm doing. But you will understand hereafter. I want you to just think of the last three and a half years which we have been together and see how many wonderful things that I have done, how many I have raised from the dead, how many I have cured. And I'm going to do something you don't expect. He knelt down to wash the feet of St. Peter. And St. Peter said, Thou canst not wash my feet. Because after all, thou art the master and I am the servant. And then what does he say? The conversation is very important because it's Holy Thursday night. It's after three and a half years. Either you've been with Christ for three and a half years and you're ready for the fight or you have not. You either have the right heart in you, or you do not. The heart must be, a, be a correct now. And here it is, though St. Peter does not understand, his heart is correct. Therefore he speaks heart to heart. There is a time to speak to the mind, and this is catechism class. We all must do a catechism class when we enter into the Catholic Church. We have to learn that there are Ten Commandments, we have to learn there are three persons in one God. We have to learn there is one holy church outside of which there is no salvation. We have to learn that the cross is the only way to heaven. We have to learn that there is happiness in Christ and in his church. We have to learn things written on paper that are most true. So we learn them. But then what? There is another knowledge which must go inside the heart. This knowledge must be inside of our hearts. This is a harder thing to teach. And it, the knowledge of our faith must go deep in our soul. And St. John, the beloved apostle, describes well. In the first chapter, the first verses of chapter 13, we read in the gospel today. He writes long, 13, 14, 15, and 16, and 17, five chapters on the Last Supper. He summarizes it in the first words of the gospel today. For he loved his own that were in this world, and he loved them unto the end. He loved his own that were in this world. Of course he loved his own that are in heaven. But there's a special love that God has, the Lord Jesus Christ has, for his own that are in this world. He loves his sheep. He goes to the farthest ends of the earth to pick up the one that was lost. He brings him back on his shoulders. He will go to the very ends of the earth to find the one lost sheep. He loves his sheep, and he loves every one of them. And in chapter 17, at the very end of these five chapters, he will say, Heavenly Father, I thank thee that I have not lost, not even one. So he began by saying, I love my sheep, and he loved them unto the end. He ends by saying, I thank thee for having heard my prayer. And this is before he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. He is training those eleven apostles. The twelfth one will not learn. He will be hung and dead by the morning. And there are so many like him. But he is training those eleven apostles. You must be shepherds. You must carry peace into a world that only knows war. You must carry love into a world that only knows hate. You must carry truth into a world that only knows lies. This is the world you will go into. And you will have no things with you. Except that you can carry upon your own back. You will carry the kingdom of heaven. What is it that makes you carry it? He loved his own, and he loved them unto the end. He will speak of the shepherds also when he says of the wicked shepherd, the wicked shepherd, he is not necessarily a Satanist, 
those are the worst of the worst. AA 1025 and the building with bad bishops who worship Satan and want to spread communism. They are few. They are there, but they are few. The majority of bishops and priests are not pleasing to God because they are hirelings. They are working for pay and not for love. They easily run when the wolf comes because they are hirelings and they work for hire and their own. And this is what our Lord says. He runs because his own, the sheep, are not. If it's my sheep, I stay and I protect it. If it's the other person's sheep, I run. If it's my sheep, we must understand as we enter this mystery of Holy Thursday, what is this sacred priesthood that he establishes? Of course, it is an infinite number of things. But the essence of the priesthood of the New Testament is the one that goes to embrace the cross and dies. That's the priest. And why does he die? He dies because of the love of the sheep. Now, not all sheep are white. Some are black. Not all sheep are good. Some are bad. One of those sheep whom Christ loved as he hung on the cross was a vicious soldier who with a great joy in his heart and a great pleasure took a spear and pierced his side. He rejoiced in torturing him when he was alive. He was not finishing in his torture when he was dead. The other soldiers stopped torturing when he was dead, but he was not finished. His hate was worse. His maliciousness was worse. His evil was worse. And with a great zest, he took that spear and he pierced the side of Christ. He wasn't finished torturing him even though he was dead. And out came blood and water. And the wicked one, the black sheep, the most wicked Longinus, saw. And as he saw, he believed. And that wicked sheep became a saint. What sheep are we supposed to love? <clears throat> this is the mystery of the priesthood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord himself said, Do not love only those who love you. Do not love only your family. We love the sheep. Now there's only two kinds of sheep in this world. White and black. And every human being on earth is sheep. And the higher they're white sheep with Christ or they're black sheep. But they must all be loved. And some of them will turn from black sheep unto white. And they shall be loved unto the end. Now we are going into a battle. Our ancestors have been in many times. It has begun. Persecution of the church. This is how it begins. Were the police going to show up and arrest us? Can't go to church. Got to keep a safe distance. Can you receive absolution from a safe distance? Can you be anointed from a safe distance? Can you love God in a safe distance? So we've got to decide. They're already telling us this economic crisis may come to an end. Because really the biggest problem is the economy. And when the economic crisis comes to an end and we come back to normal, it's not going to be like it was before. There's going to be little differences. We're going to have to recognize we can't do everything we used to do. There can't be these large gatherings. You know what the word churches in Latin comes from Greek? Ecclesia. Ecclesia. The church. Ecclesia means a gathering. 
It means I call forth people to gather in order to worship God. Church is a place where men gather to worship God. We can't gather anymore. You know what you do secretly in the night? Sin. And you don't want witnesses. Whenever a thief robs your house, he likes social distancing. Always good. <laughs> if you're being chased by the cops, and he's got a billy bat and hand gloves, social distancing is a really good idea. You don't want him to be too close. Whenever you're doing evil, social distancing is a really good idea. Where did Christ go? Where did the saints go? Right in the middle of the soup. Where are all these dying souls? Where are the hundreds of thousands of people dying? Where are they? Because that's where the priest needs to be. One of the jobs of a priest in the military is called chaplain. There's only one place he needs to be. Otherwise, he's pretty useless. In the battlefield, where the bullets are flying, and where somebody is hit. Otherwise, you don't really need him. But there's a battlefield, there's bullets flying, somebody is hit, somebody is dying, that's where the priest needs to be. That's where the doctor of souls needs to be. Now, it just so happens that Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son, became man because we are on a battlefield in which all the sheep are dying. All the sheep are on the path to hell. All the sheep are in a state of misery and despair. They are empty without God. And as his holy mother said, they have no wine. How can you be happy without wine? They have no wine. Well, I guess we better turn some water into wine. We need wine. And it says in the sacred scripture, in the book of Ecclesiastes, or Ecclesiasticus, Meliorus mores quam vita amar. Death is better than a bitter life. Who wants to live a bitter life? Life without love? Life without faith? What use is that? Better to die. Holy Ghost says that. Mele res mors from vita amara. We don't want a bitter life. Now when our Lord Jesus Christ goes to this supper, consider the scene, the real scene of that holy Thursday night. Outside, there were soldiers wanting to kill him. There was a mob ready to crucify him. Pocket. The apostles were confused. He was in the most dangerous place. Where was he? He was in Jerusalem. He just gave up on Jerusalem five days before. I guess he forgot. With some saint in the Middle Ages, let's forget his name, not some famous saint. But he had visions all the time. One day a young man came to him and said, I want to follow you. I want to be a monk like you. And he saw a vision that the man would go to hell. And he said, I see a vision of you. You're going to hell. You're going to burn. I want no one with help with me. Get out of here. No, I want to follow you. You're going to hell. Get out. You're going to hell. Get out. You're going to hell. Get out. I'm not leaving until you tell me I'm not going to hell. I said you're going to hell. And finally the angel appeared and said, look, Leave him alone. I changed my mind. He's not going to hell. And you can take him as a monk. I changed my mind. I said, okay, you can be a monk. The saint saw a vision of a man in hell. God changed his mind. Is that familiar? For there was a great type of the priest named Jonas. And Jonas was all for the destruction of Nineveh because they were wicked and they had what's coming. They were so wicked in Nineveh, just like they're wicked in America, and they're wicked in Hollywood, and they're wicked in Washington, D.C., and they're wicked in the Politburo, and they're probably wicked in the banks. And the Bilderbergers are probably wicked. I haven't met them, so I can't say for sure. But they're probably wicked. 
Is there any hope? What does a priest do? The Lord Jesus Christ came into a world on Holy Thursday night. And remember these people, they are all going to crucify him. And what is in his heart? It is his love of those that are in this world. He loved those in this world. He loves the people with the tattoos. He loves the ones on the streets. He loves the ones that are in the government. And he wants them to turn back to God. And he wants them to turn away from their life of wickedness, leaving them to eternal misery. And his heart wants the transformation of the most wicked city of Rome into a holy city. It was Rome that wanted to destroy the Catholic Church more than anything else. And what do we call our church that is Catholic? We call it a Roman Catholic Church. And the commies want to destroy us. And the bad guys want to destroy us. And the liberals want to destroy us. So what do we want of them? We want their souls to be turned back to God. What must be our heart as we enter into a battle with Christ? This is the time the battle has begun. Now let's consider our ancestors. They were brought before the magistrates. They were stoned to death. They were skinned alive. They were cut in pieces. Millions and millions of our Catholic ancestors shed their blood for Christ. How many died with anger in their hearts? How many died with hatred in their hearts? Zero. Those who die with anger in their hearts, they are not the friend of God. Those who die with hatred in their hearts, they are not the friend of God. We must ask in this time, when it's very tempting to want to kill a lot of bad guys, but not kill them the first one, like torture them for a while. Mm. And then, let them die. Is that what we want? What's the best way to torture them? Capture their souls and take them away from Satan and bring them to Christ and let the devil be tortured. That's the better way. Our Lord Jesus Christ came to save all flesh. Both the good and the bad. And we must strive to save all flesh. But this cannot happen if there is not the deep love of souls and the deep love of the sheep inside of our hearts. And this is something hard for us to get because most of us are hirelings. And we want to be good so long as it comes with a paycheck. But we can be good even without a paycheck. Remember, the paycheck does eventually always come because Christ repays all of our good work with eternal joy. But here it is, Holy Thursday night, and Christ is at that supper, and he loved his own, loved him to the end, and he says to his apostles, you don't understand what I'm doing, but let me do it anyway. You're going to understand later. Have faith. You're going to be afraid in a few hours. You're going to run away as cowards in a few hours. But don't worry, not one of you shall be harmed. The only harm you can ever get is the harm you cause to yourself. And that is the harm that Judas did. He caused harm to himself. But Judas was not harmed by anyone else. And neither were the other 11 apostles. These 12 apostles were protected by Christ. All 12. But one of them decided to harm himself. One of them decided to despair. One of them decided to commit suicide. Therefore he is harmed by his own hand. Now if we know, love, and serve God in our hearts, even though we are weak sinners, if we turn to charity rather than wrath, God will bless us. The persecution of the church has begun. There may be a respite. There will be ups and downs, but we must face the fact now that in America and throughout the world it is now illegal to be Catholic. 
It is now illegal to know, love, and serve God. Now we ask our guardian angels to help us. Because sometimes when a persecutor comes, we run. Sometimes when he comes, we hide. And sometimes when he comes, we run to embrace the cross. The saints said all of them at different times. We all know which one to do if there is not anger in our hearts. We all know which one to do if there is not selfishness in our hearts. We will know which one to do if the knowledge and love of God is deep in our hearts. And the suffering we have is because of the sin of men. And the suffering that we have because of our own sins. But not because of other foolish things. And this is the time where it's necessary to talk to our Lord. So our Lord washed the feet of those apostles. He offered the holy sacrifice of the Mass. He ordained the priests. And then he turned to them after Judas had gone out. And he said, Yam non dicam vos servos, said amicos. I now long call you slaves, but friends. This was a word that so much filled the heart of St. Augustine. They could not move past it. How can God call me his friend? For a friend is equal one to another. Now on this night, God will call a man a friend. What is this man? He's a priest. And if he is a friend of Jesus Christ, he must have his heart. And the Lord wants the heart of himself to be somehow left in the heart of the priest. And this is the great tragedy of our times. The heart of Christ is not in us, priests. There must be a sacrifice, and there must be prayer, and there must be penance amongst the souls and the church, that the heart of Christ enter into his priests. We must beg the grace to be ready to die for our sheep. That's a privilege. It covers a multitude of sins. But we are in an age in which we look at the wrong things. And we're afraid. But the Lord Jesus Christ was there with his apostles, and he ate with them for three hours. He sang a hymn. And then he walked with them to the Garden of Gethsemane, as he had gone so many times. And they went with him. <laughs> Judas went to gather them up to bring about the crucifixion. But remember that in this time, the apostles did not understand what was going on, but they stayed next to Christ. And even when they ran away from him, what did they do? Yes, they were cowards this night. They ran away. Did they run far away? No, they didn't. They couldn't. A wise man would have run to another city. He would have run very far away so they would be safe. These apostles ran, but they didn't run so far They came back in the crowd, and they followed him from a distance, and they watched him in the crowd, and they watched him be scourged, and they watched him be crowned with thorns, and they watched him be judged six different times, and they watched him be crucified, and they wept, and when he cried out with a loud voice and gave him the ghost, they were in such horror and sorrow in their hearts. But they were there, only one was missing, because he was a fool and committed suicide. Even the cowardly priest that runs away, it's okay. Just don't run too far. <clears throat> don't run too far. And also all of us, we don't understand and we run away. All right. But you can at least watch from a distance like the holy women did. Maybe not as brave as St. Mary Magdalene, not as brave as St. John, not as brave as our Holy Mother to be able to stand at the foot of the cross. But you can at least watch from afar and see what love is doing upon the cross. Because when we are in the time of suffering, which is just beginning, and it will get worse, I think it will get better and then get worse again. God only knows. 
But when we're in a time of struggle, don't go too far away from the cross. Don't run too far from Christ. And even if you run away, run back. St. Peter did. St. Mark ran away naked from the, from, the, from the garden. But he also came back. There's something about Christ that if we love him, even when we're cowards, we'll run away that we're not so far. And this is the power of the divine love. It is a magnet. And we want to be connected to that magnet. That even if we are so not weak, don't go so far from it, and the magnet will slowly bring us back. And there will always be comforts in this crisis. Always comforts. We will hear a thief say, this man has done no wrong. We will see a thief be brave. We will see Joseph and Nicodemus be strong, though we ourselves are afraid. We will see Veronica wipe the face of Jesus. And give him some comfort. We will see that most beautiful baby would ever happen. When on the way to the cross, the Holy Mother was finally able to be near him at the fourth station. Look over those 14 stations. Are they all so sad? They are all a part of the Mass. That's all they are. And this Holy Supper is a Mass. When our Lord said to his apostles, he said, When you eat this bread and when you drink this blood, until I come again, until the end of the world, you'll eat this flesh and drink this blood. So many people cannot go to Mass today. But the blood is still flowing. And the bread is still turned into the body and blood and soul of the name of Jesus Christ. To be until the ending of the world. So said Christ. And what did he say about it? As long as I take this bread, as long as you drink this chalice, it shall be a memorial of my death. That's what he said. And that's what it must be. And so it is a memorial of the death of our Lord, which is the most beautiful thing. Let's beg the grace to have a little bit of his love in our hearts. See what is the love of the cross that we don't understand. We can read books on it. We know what the saints have done. But when the cross comes to me, I don't understand. But I'm in good company because Peter didn't understand either. And he's happy. So, it's not so bad to not understand, not so bad to be a little afraid, but let us always love and know that the only answer to every trouble is Christ, his priesthood, and his cross, and peace shall prevail in this wicked world, the peace of the mind, which is divine truth, the peace of the heart, which is divine love. And the peace of our actions, which is the life of the virtue. And the peace in society, which is the kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ. This peace shall win. And it shall win in this world. As our Lady promised by a great victory, it shall win in this world as Christ made it win after by the victory of the church over the last 2,000 years. And this total victory shall be at the time of judgment, at the world's ending. But it shall have victories here and all as well. Because the love of God shall never be taken from this earth, no matter how much wickedness it has in it. So let us look to the divine love and not be too far away from the Holy Cross. In the Mass today also we remember at the end of the Mass we take the procession to the Garden of Gethsemane with the hosts that will be used for the Mass to be sanctified tomorrow. There we go for a short adoration, only a few moments, we come back. And then there will be the stripping of the altars, who have the march of the feet just now, of course. And then after then the stripping of the altars in the office of Compline, which will be part of the liturgy today, part of the sacred liturgy. And then you try to watch an hour with our Lord before midnight. At midnight, we'll have the closing of the adoration. And then tomorrow, the Good Friday, 
three hours starting at 12 o'clock to 3. And at 3 o'clock, the sacred uh, uh, mass will be sanctified uh, tomorrow and then Saturday at 10 30. Uh, at 10, the, uh, the beginning of the sacred liturgy. In any case, those that are all, and the Father's only goes to men, and the Catholic Church of the Lord's Feet.